Great to be with you all tonight. Uh, I know that switching to the live stream on Sunday nights from uh, being able to assemble together in the mornings is a little bit of a, uh, a challenge in some ways, but I think it's good for us to be reminded uh, that as, as blessed as we've been to be able to get together uh, over the last few weeks on Sunday mornings again, that it's not the case for everybody. And uh, it's good for us to be thoughtful about uh, those that are limited uh, in more ways than, than most from being able to get out and study and, and to be uh, able to have a sense perhaps that we're together with them, uh, that we are part of the same body who uh, are going through some of the same things and um, are able to hopefully try to help each other through some of the, the challenges that are unique to each of our situations. Thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 45. Psalm 45, we're going to be in that text in just a moment. Uh, and as you're turning there, uh, I want you to think about the concept, the importance of weddings and marriage in the Bible. I'm going to explain this a little bit more in detail just as we introduce the study for tonight. Uh, but before we do that, let's begin by asking God to be with us. Uh, let's bow together in prayer. Our Father above, you have everything. And you need nothing. And yet what you desire is a relationship with us. We are so humbled by that, Father. Please open our eyes to the beauty of that truth and the power of it as we study from your word tonight. And give us the desire to want the same things in our lives that you want for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we talk about the importance of marriage in the Bible, and, and to illustrate that, I think it's, it's worth noting that the Bible really begins and ends with weddings. Uh, maybe not at the very beginning and the very end, but if you look at uh, the, very, the second chapter of the divine text, Genesis 2, God takes uh, Adam and Eve, he's created them, Adam from the dust, Eve from, uh, from Adam, and he brings Eve to Adam in the garden, and essentially perform the first wedding, the first marriage ceremony. Fast forward to the very end of the Bible to Revelation chapter 19, and we see a picture in uh, Revelation of another marriage, another wedding, this time between the Lamb, Jesus, and his bride, God's people, the saints. Uh, it's described in chapter 19, and then when you get to chapter 21, that bride is, is pr presented further in, in, in greater detail. And so I think that says a lot about the significance, biblically, of marriage and of this, uh, this important relationship. Now, when we talk about why marriage is significant, why God gave it to mankind, what its intention or what its purpose is, there are a number of things that God intends uh, to come through marriage. Of course, one of them is he intends for it to be enjoyable. He gives it to us to bless us and uh, for our enjoyment. It's also something that, biblically speaking, is given for the purposes of, of procreation. God talks about how he, he creates this relationship so that uh, there's a way for him to have children, uh, godly children. Uh, but even beyond those reasons, there is even greater significance to God's purposes and God's intentions in giving us marriage. And, and one of these purposes is that it ultimately teaches us about our relationship to Christ. Let me just briefly draw your attention to a text in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, where God says this in verses 28 through 32. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now notice, at the end of this instruction to husbands about loving their wives, he says in verse 32, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. In other words, you think I've just been talking this whole time about marriage, the point of this is actually to illustrate some things to you about your relationship to Christ. And so 
seeing the significance of this, seeing God's purpose uh, when he gives us marriage, seeing that in different places in the Bible, it shouldn't surprise us that imagery shows up in the Psalms. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to turn our attention to uh, one of these Psalms, a a wedding Psalm or a a love Psalm, uh, Psalm 45. And what's really fascinating about this Psalm is that it's not just a wedding Psalm. Uh, it's, It's not just a an ordinary wedding, if there is such a thing. But this psalm celebrates the occasion of a royal wedding. The king is going to get married. And so this psalm is written to to give some instruction and to give some description about this uh, monumental occasion. Now, Psalm 45 is really divided into a couple of parts. And I'll just give you these at the very beginning. The first nine verses are addressed to the groom specifically. And then verses 10 through 17 are addressed to the bride. And so what we're going to do is we'll look at these two sections individually, but it'd be helpful for us to, as we read this, before we read it, to to understand that ancient culture, in many ways, uh, the marriage ceremony in ancient culture was very different uh, from what typically takes place in modern culture. I mean, in modern culture, uh, who would you say typically the focus of the wedding is on? Now, I understand that it's, it's significant for the bride and the groom that both families come together and all of that. But uh, typically in, in our culture, the focus of the wedding is, is perhaps more so on the bride. And I don't know anybody that's really going to argue with that too much. Uh, in fact, there's a reason that in most wedding ceremonies, the, the, the groom and the groomsmen are all up at the front. Um, and then one of the, the last things to happen is that the bride comes in and makes her interest her entrance, and everyone stands and recognizes her. Uh, the focus is on typically on the bride in our culture, but ancient cultures were not uh, typically that way. In, in ancient cultures, uh, marriage ceremonies were often focused on the groom, and you see that to some extent. For example, in places like Matthew twenty-five, when Jesus tells the parable of the uh, the wise and the foolish virgins, uh, all of them are outside waiting for the. Uh, the arrival of the groom, because the arrival of the groom was kind of the signifier that this this wedding feast was going to begin. And so once the the groom showed up, the wedding feast began, the doors were shut. uh, And so so that was the significance or that was the the starting point of this um, of this marriage feast. So keep that in mind as we as we read through this text that in ancient weddings, ancient cultures often focused on or emphasized the groom uh, perhaps more so than we do today. Let's take a look at the first nine verses of this and, and see the description of the character of the groom in this psalm. Uh, the psalm is described as, for the choir director according to the, to the lilies, a mascal of the sons of Korah, a love song. And I'm going to be reading from the standard version tonight. Verse 1, My heart is moved by a noble theme as I recite my verses to the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You are the most handsome of men. Grace flows from your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Mighty warrior, strap your sword at your side in your majesty and splendor. In your splendor, ride triumphantly in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. May your right hand show your awe-inspiring acts. Your sharpened arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Your throne, God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy more than your companions. Myrrh, aloes, and cassia perfume all your garments. From ivory palaces, harps bring you joy. King's daughters are among your honored women. The queen adorned with gold from Ophir stands at your right hand. I want you to notice uh, the different ways that the character of the groom and the work of the groom are described in the first nine verses here. We'll just go through this kind of one verse at a time. Notice in verse 2 that the king is described as the most handsome of men. Whenever he talks, grace flows from his lips. I mean, this guy is a smooth, a gracious speaker. He's blessed by God. In verse 3, he's described as a mighty warrior. In other words, 
He's strong. He's skilled. He's agile. He's athletic. This, this is the kind of guy, ladies, who's straight out of a Disney movie. Uh, the text goes on in verse 4 and emphasizes that, that he's not egotistical. I mean, if you've ever known someone who had all these qualities in the first in verses 2 and 3. They're handsome, they speak well, they're a smooth talker, they're strong and skilled and athletic. How many times have you known people like that who knew that they were all of those things? And they knew that perhaps a lot of other people that they, that they, that surrounded them weren't those things. And so they kind of took every chance they had to let the world know how skilled and strong and agile and gracious and handsome they were. And yet this king isn't like that. He's not egotistical. You notice in verse 4 that he fights with and for truth and humility and justice. And in fact, this is kind of the ideal king in some ways. I mean, if you, if you imagine for what like a, a political campaign ad in the, uh, in the Jewish world sounded like, this would probably be a pretty good one. He fights for truth and humility and justice. Skip down to verse 6 and notice that Uh, in addition to these things, that his rule has been established by God. That because he fights for these things, God has set him in a place of power. And yet, when he's been set in that place of power, he rules with justice. In other words, he hasn't been corrupted by that power. It's one thing for someone to fight for a cause. And then when they they win that battle and they're put in a position of authority where they uh, they can actually facilitate change, suddenly they're the ones that change. And instead of fighting for justice, they take advantage of their position of authority. But this king doesn't do that. His power doesn't corrupt him. Verse 7 tells us that this is the king who loves righteousness. He hates wickedness. And because of this, God has poured out joy upon him. His life is full of joy. Verse 8 tells us that he even smells good. All of his garments are full of these precious spices and ointments. He's got good entertainment. He lives, uh, he lives very extravagantly. He, he lives in ivory palaces. In fact, the picture is that maybe even his, uh, his harp players live in ivory palaces themselves. So this is, this is an, an extravagantly wealthy man. Verse 9 tells us his entourage is composed of other royals, that uh, king's daughters are among those who, uh, who have his company. And that the queen wears fine gold, some of the gold from Ophir, which would have, would have been some of the most precious gold uh, in the world at that time. In other words, ladies, this guy is a, a total catch. I mean, you see a description of someone like this, and there's not really a flaw in this, this man's armor. Everything you could dream about, everything that, uh, every ideal you could, you could imagine, he checks the boxes. Now let's turn our attention to the rest of the text and let's examine the the bride who's being married to this groom in verses 10 through 17. I want you to notice as we read through this text the difference in how they're described, the difference in how the, the bride is described compared to how the groom is described. Beginning verse 10, it says, Listen, daughter, pay attention and consider. Forget your people and your father's house and the king will desire your beauty. Bow down to him, for he is your Lord. The daughter of Tyre, the wealthy people, will seek your favor with gifts. In her chamber, the royal daughter is all glorious, her clothing embroidered with gold. In colorful garments, she is led to the king. After her, the virgins, her companions, are brought to you. They are led in, uh, they are led in with gladness and rejoicing. They enter the king's palace. Sons will succeed your ancestors. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will cause your name to be remembered for all generations. Therefore, the peoples will praise you ever and ever. Now, do you get the sense before we say anything else uh, about this description that this this bride is certainly no slouch herself? I mean, verses 13 and 14 seem to indicate that she's royalty herself. It's not like the king's just marrying uh, a commoner. That she is a, a royal daughter that she comes from royal stock, that she herself is glorious and well-dressed and wealthy, that she comes with her own entourage. And yet, when you set this description next to the description of the king, what, what stands out is that the description of the bride isn't nearly as glowing as the description of the groom. 
Now, I know that we like to think in, uh, typically, that, that all couples are, you know, kind of well-suited for each other, that the bride and the groom in any marriage or any engagement are well-matched for each other. But let's, let's be honest here. Some guys and some girls marry people that are way out of their league. Uh, and that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes it's problematic because it, it could be someone who, um, you know, a guy who meets a girl who's, who's going to bring him down. Or a girl that meets a guy that's just kind of a deadbeat, but for whatever reason he's managed to, to sweet talk her and to, to convince her that he's the guy of her dreams. And everybody else kind of looks at this from, uh, from a distance and sees that this is headed for trouble. Now, sometimes that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes when people meet and marry their league, it can have a positive effect. It can bring someone up and uh, get them to a place of improvement and growth. But I think that's sort of the picture here in the text, is that the bride is, is clearly marrying up, even though she herself comes from a royal background, that she brings a lot into this, this marriage, that she's marrying up to this groom. And so there are instructions that are given uh, to the, the bride. And I think that's one of the reasons that the descriptions are different. The, the groom, the focus of the groom is the, the character and all the things that make him desirable. And the focus of the bride is, here are your instructions to, to re- going into this uh, to make it an ideal marriage. So just the instructions that are given to her. In verse 10, it says, Listen, daughter, pay attention and consider. Forget your people and your father's house. So in other words, leave your past behind you. Give the groom your loyalty. Trade in your loyalty for your family, to, for your father, for your father's house. Trade that in for loyalty to, your, uh, to your, your new house, to your husband. And then in verse 11, bow down to him for he is your Lord. So there's this idea of honoring him by giving him her submission. These are the instructions to the bride. And, and before we go any further, I think it's worth asking what was the purpose of this? Why should uh, this bride give those to her prospective husband? Well, the answers in the text, I think, are very meaningful. Uh, the writer of this psalm tells the, the bride that if you do these things, he will, in verse 11, he will desire your beauty. Uh, in verse 12, if you do these things, that the, the daughter of Tyre, uh, foreign dignitaries, wealthy people will Come and bring gifts to you. They will bless you. Skip down to verse 16, and you notice the description here. Your sons will succeed your ancestors. In other words, your future is going to be greater than your past. All of her sons, if she had to trade in royalty in her homeland, she's going to give birth to sons who are going to become princes in the land in which she now dwells. And as a result of all this, in verse 17... Her name would be remembered for all generations. People would praise her forever and ever. There'd be this legacy of praise in every generation, in every nation. So there are a lot of benefits, a lot of reasons that are given here to this bride for, uh, for leaving her past, for showing loyalty, and, and showing submissive honor to the king. Now, I want to try to consider the significance of this for us. And, and to do that, I, w- I want you to try to appreciate with me as much as we can, and this is not uh, necessarily a natural thing, but try to appreciate with me what it would be like to read this from a Jewish perspective. I want to give you some, some uh, thoughts about how a, a Jew looking at an Old Testament text like this would have interpreted or, or would have understood something like this. Of course, and this is, I think, common sense to any of us, that the scriptures are written with an immediate context. That there is a, a place and a time and a, a writer and an audience to each of these writings, whether you're talking about Psalm 45 or Exodus or 1 Samuel or any of the, the biblical narrative. There is an immediate context, and yet the meaning of these texts is not limited exclusively to that immediate context. So there could be things that may be written by Moses, for example, in the book of Exodus, uh, intended for the, the nation of Israel, getting ready to out of the land of Egypt or getting ready to go into the promised land that, that may, are not limited in their meaning and their importance just to that generation or just to that nation. Uh, and so uh, even though there's an immediate context, the meaning of Scripture is not limited to that. Uh, what the Jews also understood about Scripture is that Scripture speaks to every generation, that from one generation to the next, there would be 
meaning and importance and significance to a text. A text that might mean, uh, that might be significant to one generation for one reason, uh, might take on a whole new significance to future generations. And that's especially true when it comes to the time of the Messiah. So one of the ways that the Jews read the Old Testament text is whenever they would see prophecies or psalms or descriptions or history or narrative, whatever the case is, they would look at those, the lessons from the text with a, a special thought given to the coming of the, the, the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, will this text be fulfilled in a, a whole different way? And we'll see, that, uh, we'll see that that's the case here with Psalm 45. Another thing that, uh, that might help us is to understand that from a Jewish perspective, and, and again, this is not just limited to the way a Jewish person would read the Old Testament text, context gives meaning to words. And so if you take a word that means one thing in one context, but you put it that same word in a new context, that new context might add additional meaning to, uh, to the words or to the original text. Uh, and so this is how New Testament writers apply texts to Christ that may have initially been or can have been about someone else, about David, for example, uh, during the, the period of the, uh, the Israelite kingdom or some, some other Old Testament figure. This is how they could, why, they, why they did that. Uh, and by the way, we do this today. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, Melanie and I in our wedding uh, used a, a song as one of our, actually as the song that we walked out uh, once we were pronounced as husband and wife, the song that we walked out to was a, a secular song from kind of like pop radio. And it was written by a, a, an artist or a songwriter uh, about a context that was specific to his life. And yet there were things that paralleled uh, our story and things that we thought in that song we wanted to say to each other, we wanted to communicate uh, as a part of our, our wedding. And so we took this secular song and used it uh, out of its original context to fit a context that was more meaningful and more personal to us. It, it's a common thing that people do. Uh, even uh, sometimes with our hymns, take a song like It Is Well With My Soul. Uh, many of you are familiar with the, the background to that hymn, that it was written by Philip Bliss, specifically about his reaction to the news that his family, m- most of his family at least, uh, had had perished in a tragic um, voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. And so he writes this song that has an immediate context, and yet we sing this, this same song, same lyrics week to week, and we make it personal. It takes on new meaning as we, as we adopt it or as we fit it to our, our personal stories and our context. So Psalm 45 is, is an example of this sort of thing. And what I want you to pay attention to is verses 6 and 7 of Psalm 45 are specifically applied to Jesus by the Hebrew writer. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, when the, the writer is going back to the Old Testament text, he takes Psalm 45 and says, this is speaking about the Son. This is speaking about Jesus the Messiah. This language about your throne being forever and ever, the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. All those are things that are connected with Jesus, even though in the original context they were being written about uh, an earthly king. Now, with that in mind, let's turn our attention to some lessons for us. Even though this may have been about originally about an earthly king, what we see here is that biblically, God, through inspiration, connects this to the Messiah. And so, with that being the case, what we see here in Psalm 45 is a picture of Jesus as the ideal king or as the ideal groom. And of course, if that's the case, who is the bride in the text? Well, the New Testament teaches very clearly that uh, the bride of Christ is are his, it's, it's his people. Christians make up the bride of Christ. You have three texts here on the screen. For the sake of time, we won't look at these, but they're there for your reference. All of these are texts that give this picture comparing the relationship between Jesus and and the church uh, to the relationship between a husband and a wife. Uh, So we are described, Christians are described as the bride of Christ. Now here's one reason that that's meaningful. When you look at Psalm 45 and you think about it from a Christian perspective, from our point of view, what this should show us is that we are recipients of the greatest marriage proposal 
of all time. That this offer of the king uh, to take this, this bride and to marry this bride is, is unparalleled in all of history. And I mean, we looked at the description of the earthly king in this text in the first nine verses. If the earthly king, as we read, was a catch, how much more of a catch is Jesus? I mean, you talk about marrying up. We could not possibly marry up any higher than entering into this covenant relationship, than by entering into this covenant relationship with Jesus. Now, do any of you feel worthy of that kind of, of relationship? Do any of you feel worthy of, of that kind of proposal? Of course not. And yet I think that's exactly what's pictured here in the text. That's exactly the point. That none of us are worthy of this, and yet Jesus knows this going into it. I mean, it's not like, you know, we're out of our league and we're just kind of, we've managed to somehow fool Jesus into thinking we're something that we're not. And then later on, we're going to have to have, you know, these awkward conversations about what we've done in our past and things that he wasn't aware of. No, Jesus offers this proposal to us knowing full well our history, knowing the choices that we've made and the sins that we've committed. And he still, in spite of all that, gives us this offer. So even though there's no way we can, we can be worthy that what it should produce is immense gratitude. A a reminder that we are undeserving objects of that that level of love. It it should make us feel incredibly humbled and grateful that someone would know us and yet still extend this kind of offer to us. And then a couple of other things I think that this text brings to mind uh, when we consider it in light of our relationship with Jesus and what it teaches us about that. Just like with the the bride in the text, there was a response that was called for. There is a response that we are called uh, to engage in as we join our lives with Christ. That same threefold response, to leave our past, to give Christ our loyalty, and to submit to his sacrificial leadership. He's already loved us. And he's already submitted himself to the Father so that we could belong to him. And so it shouldn't be too much for us to to ask for us to then in turn, in response to his sacrificial submission to the Father, to then return that with sacrificial and submissive loyalty to him. Think about this concept for a moment of of leaving our past. Uh, Any of you husbands who are watching tonight, how would you feel if, not long after you got married, if your wife started talking to you and, and asking, saying things like, you know, I, this old, this guy that I used to date uh, back before you and I met, he's, he's back in town, and, you know, he's a good friend of mine. I was just wondering if you'd be okay if he and I went out together to catch up and, you know, get coffee or get dinner or something like that. Is that okay with you? I mean, there's nothing, nothing going on there. You know, it's all innocent. Um, husbands... How would you feel about that? How would you feel about your wife going back to relationships in her past? Things that she left behind to join herself to you? And maybe that's a little bit of an extreme example, but think about it maybe in, in perhaps in different terms. Uh, let's say that not long after you got married, you're, you're, you noticed that your wife started making some changes to the house. She wanted to change the, the color of the paint on the walls, change the arrangement of the furniture, and, and that's fine, you know, that doesn't bother you any. But what, what do you suppose, how would you feel if, as she started to make these changes around the house, you started to realize that she was making these changes because she was making your house look exactly like her parents' house. Every piece of furniture, every color of paint on the walls in every room was designed to mimic the house that her her mom and dad live in, the house that she grew up in. And then as you're making decisions about finances or about family issues or or, or whatever the case is in marriage, how you're going to spend your time, what if instead of taking your input, uh, she started to make decisions because that's the way that her, her dad would do something? How long would that go on before you'd start to feel a little bit uncomfortable with that, husbands? 
or maybe, I mean, you can, you can flip the coin on that, wives, vice versa. The point is that in these relationships, we expect the commitment that comes with leaving behind our past, leaving that uh, and, and joining ourselves and going in the same direction to our spouse. And that's exactly the kind of response that Christ calls us to have. Uh, especially when we consider that our past, th- there was nothing good in our past. I mean, it'd be like, you know, going back to these relationships or going back to, you know, mom and dad's house when that past history was one of abuse and mistreatment. There's nothing for us in the past. We leave our past because it's what kept us from Jesus in the first place. And I want you to notice the reward of that. If we do that, if we leave our past, if we give him our loyalty, if we submit to his sacrificial leadership, he will desire our beauty. For everybody who's ever wanted that one thing, whether you've gotten it in life or you're still searching for it, I mean, one of the, maybe one of the most fundamental needs that we have in life is we want to be desirable to somebody. Whether it's to a parent or a spouse or a child or a friend, every, everybody wants someone who desires a relationship with us. And so the reward, the promise that God gives us is that if we leave all those things behind and we come to him in loyalty, that he will desire our beauty. I mean, can you imagine from Christ's perspective, is there any more beautiful thing than someone who comes out of a past that was opposed in every way to him and sees that and is willing to say, I don't want any part of that anymore. What I want more than anything else is to to be in this relationship with Christ, with my Savior. And they give it all up. Can you imagine how beautiful that must be to Christ? He will desire our beauty if we come to him. And then the other uh, part of this reward is that what is gained will, be, will outweigh what's given up. The, the picture in the text, of course, was that sons will succeed ancestors, that sons will replace fathers. The, the point is that the past, the things that we have to give up, will be replaced by the things that we gain. They'll be outweighed by the benefits that we gain in the future. So the picture is that we lose our life now so that we can gain it in Christ. That's why Jesus told the apostles in, in Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, that there's, there's no one who gives up house and father and mother and brother and sister and land in this life who won't gain all those things back a hundredfold along with persecutions, but in this life we'll get all those things and then in the life to come we'll get eternal life. That's why Paul would tell the Philippians in Philippians 3 that the things that he had in his past, he counted as rubbish. They were nothing to him because the the thing that was in front of him that he was pursuing was that much more valuable. Pursue those things. God will make us royalty. He will remember us, as the, the text indicates in verse 17 of Psalm 45, for all generations... We will be praised as a part of this bride who's made spotless by the blood of Christ. We'll get to be a part of that beautiful relationship. And it won't be one that we ever have to give up. It's going to be one that's eternal. It's for good. It's for all time. Those are the rewards that are offered to us in this relationship. And that's the beauty of this invitation that God gives to us. Those of you that are watching tonight, if you're not a Christian... I hope more than anything that what you see from this text is a God who loves you so much. Like we, like we talked about this morning, like Scott talked about from Romans 5. Loves us so much that, that he's willing to give everything so that we can be in a relationship with him. He's willing to do the things that we can't do to provide for this relationship. You are valued no matter what has come in your past, no matter what decisions you're making in your life right now. You are valued in ways that you'll never be valued by any man or any woman. You're valued by God, by Christ. And so we invite you to to see the importance of that, to to welcome that in your life, to seek that out. And if 
If you don't know how to do that, then talk to us. Get in touch with us, with us online on the live stream. Get in touch with us through our website. Give us a call. Whatever the, the case is, let us know how we can connect you to the love of Christ, get you answers for your questions, if that's what you need tonight. Thanks so much for your attention. God bless us as we seek to be the kind of people, the kind of bride that he will welcome into eternity. Thanks for watching, everybody.